A little bit earlier today, I spoke with Penny Kelly, author of The Robes. It's a story I've been wanting to bring to you for quite a while because I so deeply resonated with the richness of the information, but it didn't come easily. Penny was an unemployed mother with four children on welfare, trying to study for a pre-med degree when her life started falling apart. She got divorced, um, had no real support, had a kundalini awakening that just blasted her open. And all of a sudden, these little men in brown robes started appearing to her in her kitchen, her bedroom, her living room, and started showing her glimpses of the future. It was very startling. She was not a willing participant initially, but the information that she finally documented and finally brought through is absolutely stunning in its implications. So without further ado, we'll go to my conversation with Penny Kelly. Welcome, Penny, and let's go back down memory lane to what your life was like when this all started in the late 70s. Uh, it was pretty, um, well, I could say it was pretty boring. Um, it was pretty normal. You know, I was working, but I was also, um, the whole thing started with Kundalini. I had a full-blown series of Kundalini experiences, and that just kind of changes everything about your consciousness and um, your perception and your ability to know and to see into other dimensions and communicate with other beings. And so that part of my life was really, I was really struggling with that. The rest of it, you know, I had kids, I had a house, I was working as an engineer at Chrysler, I went to work every day, you know, paid my bills, that was it. Um, and I, I would say that at that time, I was pretty small-minded. I was very uncaring, uh, and I wasn't paying any attention to what was happening in the world. I didn't care. I'll, you know, I was caught up with my own self and my own life. And when the robes came along, all of that changed dramatically. So, um, you know, there was just this combination of things that came together, one being Kundalini, one being the fact that I was going to school and I was in an experimental college at Wayne State for integrative learning, which was phenomenal. And, um, and the other was the robes. And those three things came together. And so here we are. <laughs> and it wasn't always convenient. I mean, at one point, you're now divorced. You have four kids. You're on a well. Oh. You're trying to be, go to pre-med school. And all yeah. everything is just kind of crashing in on you from all sides. And yeah. the interesting thing is you didn't seem to want to hear these messages at all. You seem somewhat hostile. Yeah when these uh, little little beings, these little men showed up. Yeah, that's a very good word, hostile. <laughs> I mean, that's putting it mildly, you know. I was basically freaking out over it and just wanted them to go away. Um, you know, I really, I had just come out of that long period of being divorced, four kids, you know, trying to go to school, um, you know, is it struggling on welfare? And, and nobody thought it was a good idea for me to go on welfare, but I thought that's what it's for. It's to help people like me because what are my options? If I don't create any options, then, you know, I'm going nowhere. And I had a dream. I wanted to heal people. And so, you know, so I had finally gotten to this place where the, I realized there's no way that, um, you know, a woman on welfare with four kids going to school on a Pell Grant is going to make it through med school. It just wasn't going to happen. And so I switched to engineering and um and thought oh i'm doing this for the money you know it was the doors were opening for women at that point it was 1978 and so i thought okay let's go for engineering i had always been interested in how do things work um you know how and why what makes that tick 
So, and, and that curiosity was deep and it had been with me for my whole life. So that's where I was at. That's what was happening at that point. Well, it seems that level of intelligence uh, and curiosity may have been one of the very reasons that the robes, these little beings, chose you to start showing these things to, even if you weren't unwilling at the time. Because as I went through yeah. this book, I have to tell you, I think, you know, I have the book here. I think I have at least 100 pages of it dog-eared. It is so <laughs> with nutrients, so to speak, for the, the mind and soul, and ultimately the body. But, uh, you know, to begin grappling with what, looks, what the future looks like, like was not an easy thing. So let's begin with what they originally showed you. And toward the beginning of the book, they were showing you that many changes were coming for humanity, and they needed to start showing you maybe others now so we could contend with it when the time came. Yeah, I think that's really true. Um, you know, they started out, they just wanted to show me some pictures. I just wanted them to go away. So after the first three visits or so, you know, I thought, okay, I'll look at the pictures, they'll go away. Well, the pictures were so stunning that there was no going away. You know, you can't not know once you know something you can't unsee or unhear and so that was really a big change for me you know they showed me pictures of that went all the way to the year 2413 and i went into a number of those but they started with this picture of the planet and that there would be changes in the planet herself and changes in, uh, what would I say, our, our world, changes in our globe, and changes in the United States, and in the population, in the consciousness, all the institutions. I mean, they just rolled right through. It's kind of like having a bulldozer in your life so right no absolutely i mean it would be shocking for anyone well one of the things they showed you were some of the earth changes that we have heard about from edgar casey and other people in times past there would be kind of catastrophic events earthquakes here and there that would change the geography of it. And i would encourage people to maybe go to some of the formerly laid out information on that so we don't have to spend too much time on those earth changes um, but what they did show is that there would be this, and this is significant to our future, breakup of nation states, for example, and you were shown a different kind of map, and we'll just start with the United States and what, what our future looked like in terms of how we were put into regions. Yeah, um, they, you know, one of the things that was clear was that the coastlines would become difficult to live on and dangerous to live on and there were there was quite a few places that were underwater but the um there was so much chaos and you know and and i i did in the book i did not i did not put everything in the book that i saw because some of it was too um it was almost unbelievable I was like, no, no way, that, there's no way. I didn't even want to say what I did say. And, um, and so there were some things that I hedged a little bit, but there was this long period of chaos. And they said that that period would become extremely intense between 2015 and 2021. And in that period, the slow breakup of the U.S. would begin. And different people would not want to go along with the government. I did see some things about the cabal, which I did not put in the book because I found that too hard to get my own mind around. What but did you, um, What did you see? I saw... <sighs> I saw the, the 12 or 13 families who were members of the cabal. I saw that it was mostly a business um, arrangement and that there was 
there were some awful things that were happening. I, did, I, I might cry if I have to talk about them. They were so terrible. Um, and, and that when that cabal started to break up, there would be just mass chaos around the U.S. and that it could get pretty rough for people. Um, so, you know, what happened was that people, you know, and they outlined a lot of this in the book, you know, there would be the rise of business to power. Yes, and I'll there, go there in some detail. Um, but the cabal, yeah. really, the cabal is really at the core of it. And so, right. okay, so let's, okay, going back to the notion of how the country looked in terms of its regions, it appeared to be mostly divided around Oklahoma north and south, and then from yeah. the northeast down uh, to about Georgia, and in as far as Kentucky was the, that was the eastern part of the country, and then right. south, and then you had this odd little region kind of triangulated up in the northwest, that was uh -huh. uh, northern, northern, northern uh, California, plus Oregon and Washington. And interesting, that area, I think it's called, what's it called? The free state of Jefferson now. Uh, you see the billboards when you're driving through southern Oregon. They're attempting uh -huh. to become their own nation state up there as we speak. So this was again 40 okay. years ago when you were shown this, but that's showing up now. Uh -huh. Yeah, that little area in in the map that I put in the book, um, I outlined that because that's where the withdrawals from the U.S. began. Well, that's where and it's then, happening right now. Yeah. 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 I was really, I have some family out that way, and they, um, and a lot of friends in California, and they don't really consider themselves to be part of this government and part of the nation as I always thought of them. <laughs> they think of themselves as very different now. And, um, you know, the, the breakup was into three major re sections to start with, and then it started break those started breaking up into um i guess i would call them bio regions and for economic reasons and survival reasons and um so you know there were lots and lots of changes and um and i watched that thinking no 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 <laughs> you know not wanting to see that but um really stunned at the depth of the hurt, the anger, and the um, deprivation that was going on, I could see that there were reasons, that there were valid reasons. People had to make decisions on their own. And at the time, everybody had stepped into, and you can see this now, even, you know, today still, um, they had stepped into this attitude of the government will fix it, the government will do it, the government is responsible for everything, and the government, according to the robes, had grossly overstepped their bounds. Way out in, you know, out of the boundaries of governing, and governance into all sorts of silly, foolish um, decision making, and um, and they said, you know, the result of that overstepping of bounds and people giving away their power is nobody has any inner authority anymore, and so that was a big reason why people were breaking up and they were taking back their power. Interesting. And they were doing it angrily. Yes. And interestingly, well, a couple things. This is just an aside. And I keep wondering where it's coming from. And I, Zeus, my husband Zeus and I have joked about it. When I keep saying, well, when we get back to the country, and I'm talking about when we get back to the country of California. And, and I yeah. use that in relationship to California. I've, I've been living between Arizona and California for a long time. But I always refer to California subconsciously as a country. I wonder if I'm like tapping yeah. into 
the future rather than some other weird concept economically. But what I wanted to ask you also is, or comment and then ask is, they talked about the kind of leaders that we would begin electing into our future, which would be much more grandiose, kind of more answering ego, unstable and so forth, which is, where we are now, it would appear, but it's all that's true. toward something greater. Can you explain that to us? Um, yeah, and, and I would probably add to that a little bit. Um, they said that a leader is a perfect reflection of the people and where those people are at mentally, emotionally, spiritually at the time. And that when we could not or would not see clearly into the depths of an individual and we fell for the hype and the illusion, etc., that we could and did and had some very bad leaders and they were very careful about blame. They did not blame, they just presented information. But they made it clear that that leader or those leaders were our choices because we were seeing and assessing at too shallow a depth. They then said, if you're going to have good leaders, you know, the leader should sort of come from the crowd because he or she has a certain set of skills, a certain perspective, certain level of wisdom, is familiar with the issues involved in whatever the problem is. They would lead, and when the problem was resolved, they would kind of step back in, kind of melt back into the population. And another issue would come up and maybe a different leader would step up. And um, they had a whole different way of assessing leadership. And they said that um, we would very soon, we would have a, a period of temporary leadership um, that nobody would listen to, and then everybody would complain about, and there would be a lot of people saying, you know, no, I'm not going along with that, kind of an anarchy. At the time, I didn't really know what anarchy was, but now I do. And, um, and that period would then be followed by gangs, and a lot of uh, really serious chaos. And then there was um, finally by about 2040, 2050, things were beginning to settle a little bit and people had grouped very differently, etc. cetera. Um, so lots and lots of change. Well, within so. that change, they said that there would be a move away from government leadership to the takeover of government, essentially what looks like government, by corporations, the which John um, uh, Confessions, economic hitman, um, John Perkins. Perkins, yeah, John Perkins, yeah, called, you know, yeah. democracy, which we can see is absolutely yeah. well underway now. And one of the comments they made in the book, The Robe is Made, was that a, a, a king in times past or a proper leader is really there to help the people reflect their own inner authority and desires and bring them out of themselves to create a rich and complex society, not what we have now. Well, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that was one of the big points that they made several times, which was that the king, if it was a good king or a good leader, a good president, um, even a good dictator, would try to lead his people into, um, they use the term fullness mm -hmm. of their own, you know, their own self, their own life, their own consciousness. And that was something that, um, you know, that I think we started to see with, um, you know, with JFK, he set a few goals. It was to the moon, <laughs> you know, that's, um, you know, maybe better than having a war. So um, there, you know, that was an important piece that the leader, most, they said most of the leaders that are going to arise after 2010, that was their, their turning point point. 
for the, when the demise of the, what did you call it, the corporatocracy? Corporatocracy would be, yeah, where the corporations are exerting the greatest influence, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I did ask them, so when does this all begin? And they said, it's already begun. And and I, I thought, oh, okay, because I couldn't see it at that time. You can certainly see it now. And I think, it, you know, they, when they said it's already begun, in my own thinking, I thought, okay, this is 1980. Um, you know, so 20 or 30 years from now is what they said that period would be run by corporations in the background who were using governments as puppets. The governments made the laws that favored the corporations and the corporations ran the money and made the decisions and did whatever they want um, wanted. And so I thought, okay, 20 or 30 years, that's why they're using 2010 as this turning point. And it got worse from 2010 on and then reached a, a peak of craziness between 2015 and 2021. And, um, and I think, you know, the worst years were 2017, 2018. So we're right there right now. And lots of information is coming out. And, um, and some of it I've already seen and some of it because when kundalini happens, uh, you become clairvoyant and clairaudient. I went looking, you know, to see what else I could see. And I also began to see, um, how do I call it, like hints. Like I'd see the very earliest threads of something. And so I would watch something unfold and I would think, oh, I know right where that's going. And so that was hard to, it was hard to have to see that and to realize that if there was going to be a change, it had to come from the top because the average person doesn't have the power or the reach to take down um, and they, the cabal. And they never called it the cabal. They always called it the families. Um, that was their term, 12 or 13 families. Um, and then there were a couple of key people who were not in the family, but they, you know, Murdoch was in the family, but he was a key person for ending the corporatocracy. So uh, Gorbachev was the first one, Murdoch was the second one. And he didn't have any intention of ending it, Murdoch didn't but his business decisions ended up going in that direction so um, and those were the only two people that I you know recognized in that whole thing but um, leadership was they focused on leadership for a lot they said most of your leaders in the period between 2010 and 2020 are going to be spiritual leaders the spiritual teachers you know deep thinkers philosophers, stuff like that. So, um, you know, they said you're going to have a real struggle with your, quote, elected or um, what do you call that, instituted governments. And we are. It's, it's rough right Absolutely. now. So. There's such a great polarization happening. And one of the things, I mean, the timing makes sense because Reagan came into power right after they told you this. And this was the beginning of the rise of the corporatocracy. And so that out it actually when, started with the death of JFK. Well, it started was, with the death of yes, you're right. In the families, that yeah, influence in particular, you're right. And then just right. public policy or legislative policy that allowed that to deepen under Reagan. And so that's right. Now we have this period of revelation of sorts where people are getting where they're being manipulated and conned and used as a pawn in the system by the corporatocracy. And they're kind of done with it. We're kind of getting to that stage, which is time yeah. to have, right? Right? That's and right. That's huge right. Huge polarization in society. Yeah. Almost yeah. Like looking at dividing lines on a map, right? Yeah. So you're seeing this is that true. unfold. And then what's interesting, one of the things that's controversial here in your book, but interesting, is they talked about how 
you would know that it's starting to crumble when women would start climbing into power in the legislature yeah. and stuff. And, and they said because it was actually not through some perceived merit and win that women were believing had occurred, but rather by default because a lot of the men in yeah. the positions had started bailing because they knew the system was doomed. It wasn't working anymore. So by default, we would be, have a little space to rise up. And I thought, that's, that's right. Interesting. That's not how we, you know, we perceive it on the ground right now. I know. <laughs> I know. Um, they said, you know, when the rats begin leaving the ship, the women are going to step in and try to save it, and that it was not savable. But they, you know, and they said women would take the blame for much of the, you know, of the disintegration and the um, fallout from the collapse of government. But they, they were very clear in that they said, um, you know, it's not all going to happen at once it's you know and and i was you know i was like just let it come down and cl let's clean it up and and they were like no 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 it's going to be this jerky back and forth kind of process that you know it, oh, it looks good today or this week or this year and you know next week it's a disaster again or this isn't working or that's not working um, and that it would be very difficult um, that people who were um, how do I call how do I, let's see people who were served by the old structures would still be alive and they would be hanging on to those old structures for dear life there would be a whole group of new people, young people, who were moving into a world that was vastly different in its lifestyles and in everything, in every way. And, and the two worlds would just kind of like come apart. The old ones would try to hang on to what they had and make that work. And eventually when they were all gone, we would be in this brave new world. And I'll tell you what, it was, um, you know, it was very different from what we, from what I grew up with. <laughs> so up to that point in time, up to 1978, 980, absolutely. It was completely yeah. And that wouldn't have been a normal vision for anyone to have had. But they did show you very specific things too, such as the Berlin Wall coming down and the Soviet yeah. Union breaking up. And they also showed you kind of a different view of Gorbachev than what a lot of people may have had in terms of who this being. Maybe you can talk about that a bit. Yeah, they were um, they were very clear that the entire um, population of the planet was here to evolve themselves. That was the point that they made again and again. It's about personal evolution. It's about the evolution of the human. And so I'm like, okay, uh, yeah, all, all right. <laughs> um, it, but I had really no clear idea at all about what that meant or what was involved in that, not like I do now. After 40 years of researching consciousness and having entered some extraordinary states of consciousness, um, we have a long way to go. And, and that's what they were referring to, is that we are going to evolve into those states. So, you know, evolution is predicated on change. And what they pointed out was that the um, the families, the cabal families, would uh, would become a huge obstacle to change. They would distract people with music, with entertainment, with um, you know food, with poor food, especially with all sorts of meaningless drivel, and people would go for that, and they would not focus on the reason they were here, which was to develop their consciousness. And so, you know, the, everything kind of came to a standstill, and Gorbachev was the one who was to pull the pin on the first 
nation to go down, to come apart. And if he did not do his piece, then it wasn't going to happen for the rest of the world. We would disintegrate eventually and, and destroy one another, destroy ourselves and one another. And, and so I, you know, I didn't really, um, you know, I, I still was having a hard time believing what I was seeing. But the first time I saw Gorbachev um, in the news, I was like, oh, he's real. He exists. <laughs> he's, there's, you know. So then I started watching him. And sure enough, you know, he one day woke up. Um, and they said he his entire goal in coming here is to get his himself up to the top of the ladder, top of the heap, in the USSR, so that he could dissolve it and start the process of bringing nations down. Nations from the position of the robes, nations did little more than create boundaries and barriers of selfishness, fear, and greed. And they, they didn't have a whole lot of use for nations. They, weren't, they didn't attack, but they made it clear that nations were um, a huge obstruction in terms of uh, developing global telepathy, global consciousness, you know, and, and so they um, were very, very interested in, um, you know, in helping anybody like myself who was struggling with Kundalini. You know, they, the ropes kind of went around the world and just watched to see who was waking up, which is what Kundalini does. <coughs> so, you know, long story short, Gorbachev came along, he pulled the pin, the USSR came apart, voila. Now what is the U.S. about? You know, the U.S. Is, it has to deal with the fact that it's a lone superpower. It was only a superpower because they, they had a worthy enemy in Castaneda terms, you know, Ro Russia was a worthy enemy. Without a worthy enemy, where did we have to go? We had nowhere else to go except to begin evolving into the next state of being. And that's happening now. And most people are not aware. Um, but it's, we're headed toward a phenomenal future. And um, so back to Gorbachev, after he pulled the pin, and the USSR came apart. Um, I saw Rupert Murdoch. He was presented in such a way that he would inadvertently um, begin the dissolution of the US. And so I watched him for years and thought, he's not doing anything. I don't see anything. I don't see anything. And then, and, and I never watched TV, uh, never. Um, you know, I just don't have any, I don't have time for, for that kind of stuff. And so, um, so I had a friend who I kind of got to know. Um, he came here, took my classes, and he talked about Fox TV all the time. And finally, one day I thought, okay, and, and every so often I'd hear jokes about Fox TV. And so one day I thought, let's just watch an episode or whatever they've got. It was a news program. And so, um, so I did and was stunned to discover that they were skirting the issues. They were, they were close to the truth. They were creating all kinds of havoc. They were you know, just they were debunked over and over. They their people were had, were, you know, laughed at and kind of made fun of, et cetera. But I discovered that Rupert Murdoch was the owner of Fox TV, and when they made their decision um, to you know kind of be sort of an alternate news channel, that was the decision that starts the breakup of the U.S., that, that builds the, the split and builds the, you know, the anger and the chaos. That so makes, here we are. 
Yeah, I mean, it created, yeah. it, be, it was the beginning of a vast type of polarization we haven't known before in the psyche of the people of this country, even family members and family members. And, you know, and so going yeah. over to the, going back to the current paradigm of the corporatocracy, which is not going to let go until the families let go, I wanted to read a quote out of your book because it was so, okay. not so relevant. So after... Once they start wresting power, this is how they do it. Quote, with control over huge amounts of wealth, their own spies, lawyers, communicate, and customer service centers that are all enhanced. Also, they have armed security, assassins, and so forth. The corporations will step seamlessly into the role of government. And that right. is yeah. Yeah, I, I, I remember when, you know, when that dawned on me that that was true. It was, you know, I wrote the book and yet I was still shocked when I realized that that was right on target. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So we're there and the families aren't letting go. That's going to be a matter of probably just going through life cycles when many of them are no longer on the earth and their offspring are part of the solution because some of the offspring are choosing to change the way of the families already. That's right. Yeah. That's true. And so then now the young people in this country are finding their own ways to kind of get together, whether it's a family that they've chosen, living a lot of people to a home, extended family becomes a big part of our future. And this yeah. behavior, but also the emergence of something that is more like a world council. That scares people because they think of one world government, but that's not exactly what the robes showed you, right? No. No, the world council was a council of elders. Hang on here. Um, and that council of elders really was something that um, operated in a totally different fashion. They were very ethical. They were very um, wise in so many ways. And so people would settle most of their issues in their region or in their family or, you know, in their local area. And when they couldn't, this, you know, this council of elders would send two or three or four elders into an area, and they would live in that area, sometimes for six months, and they would listen to the people, they would look at what's actually going on, um, and they would begin to um, get a real flavor for what's the bottom line truth here. And then they would make recommendations and those recommendations would go out to the local people and and usually they were so wise and made such sense that people would say oh okay yeah and they would also facilitate um, what I'm gonna call personal growth in the people who were leaders in a region and that personal growth would then be reflected back to the people themselves it was just a very different kind of system everybody was based in something that i'm going to call personal responsibility they had developed their consciousness and they were taking responsibility for their behavior their attitude and what they did in the world and the way they got along with people so it was a very different way of of living and i liked it i like what i saw no, that makes absolute sense. Personal responsibility, sovereignty of mind, purpose rising from within. And that takes us back to some of the signs of what would happen and what would create the need for this change. And it had to do with, they said when it comes, that we have a lot of over-legislation almost and a lot of uh, not just help, but also entitlement in terms of our entire system, whether it be healthcare, wealth, welfare, and et cetera, that um, would enable people to not have to put the best of themselves into their own care, that this legislation would essentially bankrupt the country. 
ultimately across the country. And we're looking at yeah. Medicare right now and the arguments going on around it and what that social security even and what that's going to do to the U.S.'s future in terms of bankrupting it. So it seems like we're right yeah. on the precipice of the system failing economically. I mean, some would say it already has failed, right? And the beginning of that. And then they said people, the robe said people will begin um, protesting and not their taxes anymore. Right, that was going to be true. the trend that we would see that would begin the collapse economically of the U.S., for example. Yeah, um, there was a point where the government was so ineffective, couldn't get anything done. Nobody could agree on anything, and the, and the truth about the the families, the cabal families, was coming out all over the place and some of the stuff i saw was just awful um and so those two things the stalemate in the government and the facts about what was going on under the surface and how corrupt everything was that was those were the two reasons why people said that's it i'm done i'm not sending you any more money it became clear to people that most of the money they sent in did not go back into roads and bridges and things, you know, infrastructure that we need to carry on. Um, you know, it was going off somewhere into somebody's pocket, a lot of payoffs, and people just said, no, I'm not, I'm not paying taxes until you straighten up. You know, you're my government. The people started saying, you know, you're here for me. I'm not here for you in terms of the government. You know, government, you belong to me. And that whole thing just mushroomed and there was some fighting in the mid, you know, between 2020 and 2030, civil wars, um, lots of lots of stuff that was not good um and so you know the, the tax thing kind of went the way of <laughs> um you know the the, the robes actually said the government is going to go the way of the catholic church and at the time i was like what you know what that was struck me as just the weirdest reference um you know why would they say that and then after they made that comment, I noticed that all this pedophilia stuff was happening within the church, and I was raised Catholic. I wasn't practicing at the time that they came around, but, you know, it was kind of sad to see that whole structure that I had once thought of as so magnificent um, just fall into the dust, just, you know, become something to be ashamed of. And, um, and that, I, you know, I look at that now and I think, uh-oh, <laughs> if the government is going the way of the Catholic Church, is it because the reasons are the same, you know, pedophilia? And sure enough, all of that is now unfolding and um, it's pretty messy for a lot of people. And I think we have, as people, we have a massive challenge in front of us. You know, do we tear things apart? Or do we, do we forgive? You know, do we get to the truth? Do we make changes and forgive? You know, what do we do? How do we handle that? It's a big challenge for the, our population. Absolutely. So, one of the, yeah. one of the <laughs> people who I've interviewed from time to time is Sheila Gillette, which uh, channels the Theo group. And about, uh, let's see, I think it was eight years ago, they said that by 2020, we would start seeing significant shifts in the way the government was run. The two-party system would start breaking up, that there would start being people that would rise to the top that would be reflective of the population's desires and values rather than just beholden to right. themselves and the lobbyists, right? Yes. Is that more That's like right. we're shown as well? Yeah, yeah, there, um, by 2020, um, there was so much disintegration of the government that by 2021, even the people who were like over 70 and, and 70 and above in age, even those people were saying, 
it's over. It's never going to be the, the way it used to be. And that's only a couple of years away. And, you know, my hope is that we can navigate that with some kind of gracefulness, some kind of honesty, and, um, you know, and some real action, not just talk. So we have a big challenge in front of us. And absolutely. the Theo group is right on. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So. And they also, I mean, they're, yeah. we're going to, by the way, because you and I talked beforehand, there is so much information here. And this is just the first book that we've already made the decision. We're going to break this into two or three different conversations because we've barely climbed into it. We're like 70 pages into the first book at this right. point. We want to bring up a couple more, a couple more things. And that is one of the things they talked about, that there would be a radical change in weather patterns and storm patterns and so forth, which we're beginning to see. And I'd like you to comment on that and the reason for it. But also as a result of that, uh, major impacts on our economy as a result of resources that we can no longer rely on having access to and so forth. Yeah. Okay. Um, so one of the things that the robes did with me was spend several visits in which the focus was on teaching me about frequencies. I did not really pay that much of attention to frequencies until they entered my life. And then what became clear to me through their teaching was that everything was frequency and and so and then following that you know years later I began working with Dr. William Levengood and spent 15 years working in the lab with him studying um, plasma and plasma activities and frequencies and etc so I have a pretty good understanding of plasma physics. I'm not a mathematician and I'm not a scientist, but it really pulled the whole frequency piece together for me into something that um, was, it became, it was stunning information. So, so now with that as kind of a preamble, one of the things the robes said was that the weather was going to change, that there were cyclic changes. In other words, there was a cycle in the sun, a cycle in the planet, a cycle in the galaxy, um, you know, and a cycle in human consciousness as well, a cycle in the consciousness of the earth. And that we were coming to a point in time when all of those cycles were going to hit at the same time. So they said that is one of the reasons for the changes, um, the weather changes. The second thing they said was that the weather, the wind, the rain, the lightning, lightning is plasma, um, all of those things are um, our frequencies and they are responding to one another. So you have a big tree. It's a gigantic energy pathway from energy coming out of the earth and up through the tree. And that trees, when they get dry, their frequency changes in such a way that they begin to attract frequencies that have wet in them. And they call it literally, they said they call the rain. And so when we cut down trees by the thousands, it changes the weather for that entire area. That was a problem. Water, also frequencies, frequencies emanating from the water. When the water becomes full of junk or poison or changes its frequency, it loses its ability to call rain or to give off rain or it gives off too much and we end up drowning. And so what became clear, those are just two small examples, is that everything is in a relationship and when we disturb the frequency relationship, we disturb all of the behaviors. And that's, you know, that was a major piece of it. And then the rest of the, the change they attributed to our own ignorance um, and our lack of connection to Mother Nature. 
Um, in the ancient times, um, indigenous groups and tribes had a relationship with the wind, with the rain, with the sun, with the earth, with the bugs and the animals and everything. And, and that was a conversation that went on and everybody kind of listened to everybody else and everything else. And we do not do that anymore. We don't pay any attention to nature. And that later came up as a point, a survival point, that we would have to be very um, careful that we uh, connected with Mother Nature again because we would have to begin communicating with her in order to get special of effects <laughs> like rain or like relief from rain or sun um, etc or temperature you know winds bringing warm weather or cooler weather etc all of those forces are just doing whatever because we are not giving any input they are they wait for our input and I have since you know in the 40 years since um, developed relationships with wind and rain and earth and sun and all of all of those things and I use that and I 95 to 99 percent of the time I get what I ask for and um, and I only ask for what I really need and um, and that is something that those factors the cycles in the sun and the planet herself in the galaxy, the disturbance in the frequencies, and the failure of the humans to maintain relationships with all of the elements, those were the re reasons for the drastic, drastic weather changes. Interesting, so. because then that fosters economic changes. And this is a quote out of the book. It says, your rigid economics based on predictability and control will shatter again and again till you get, you cannot rebuild the system in the same way. Anymore. And that's going to require each of us having a personal relationship with nature and our food sources, which I'm personally very happy to hear. We're way too yeah. far from that. And that's why I agree. nature is that relationship. There are some other really beautiful things about, many beautiful things about the future that they showed you, yeah. To get there, we have to trip through some pretty uncomfortable stuff, right? Yeah. And then we're right. Already, we're already starting to see that. But um, I think one of the things I want to bring up at, at, toward the end of the conversation, which we're approaching right now, is that there are businesses and there are economic parts of the economy that will continue functioning well um, even through all of these changes. And they gave you a few areas where that should do okay. And maybe you can right. mention those and then we'll just use a little bit about what comes up in our next conversation because there's so much okay. to talk about. Okay, so the areas that they said um, well, first of all, let me say that there were changes in every single aspect of our life. Um, the, the areas that would do well would be education, media, and communication. But there were massive changes in medicine, all of the medicine changes. You know, people no longer sent their kids to school. Um, you know, there were massive changes in the financial realm. Um, big changes, of course, as we were talking in government. Um, big, big, big changes in terms of transportation. Um, lots and lots of stuff. Very futuristic. Very. Um, and, and so the media, the education, and the communication, those were areas where um, I think it, it, they kept talking about this thing called the global network, which yes. way, way back then was like, okay, what, what exactly are you talking about? <laughs> you know, and they kept saying this global network would eventually be joined around the entire planet and that it was key for our evolution and the development of consciousness, that this was a global brain and it would symbolize global consciousness. And, and at, 
as that took shape, you know, I watched that thinking, that's exactly what it is. And as we learn to communicate, I think we're learning to be savvy about who's pulling our leg, who's, you know, who's trying to do some kind of damage with a virus, you know, what's true and what's just made up stuff, what's been left out. What's been added in to that story? Um, and so the, our sophistication around communication is just, um, it's changing by the day. And, you know, and there's a lot of stuff with software that I'm not real familiar with, but I track what's happening in the world because that's just what I do nowadays <laughs> is track what's going on in the world. Um, and there is some phenomenal phenomenal software and changes all the ai what is artificial intelligence it's nothing other than the um, projection of intuition that's all and you know and we're making robots you know we can talk about all that later but that whole communication piece um that really is critical for us to come to peace with one another and understanding and once we communicate at that level we really don't have the the um the national barrier thing to worry about or to um you know be in the way education oh my education uh, the schools closed Nobody could afford to keep the infrastructure open. Infrastructure was falling apart in a lot of places. And so as people didn't move around quite as much in the 2020s in the U.S., I don't, you know, we'll just leave it to the U.S. for now. But um, the communication just mushroomed. You know, we might as well have been living in one another's pockets because the communication was continuous. It was cross-border. It was global. It was cross-cultural. Um, and it was economic communication and trade as well as just chat. You know, how are you doing today? What's going on in that corner of the world? Um, all education was done by individuals who were trained, who were, um, what do I say, they, they would get on the web and they would go to school. And they would create a portfolio of classes and ideas and things that they studied or things that they were interested in or things that they produced. And that was education of the future and then um you know it just the whole media thing changes from this um what i'm gonna i call it hero based media where you have a fabulous rock star or a fabulous movie star that goes away to a huge degree not completely because everybody celebrates people with extraordinary um, gifts, musical gifts, or dance gifts, or just, you know, whatever the gifts are. Um, everybody appreciates that kind of, um, you know, stunning capacity. But the idea of the, of the movie star who came through the Hollywood mill, or the, you know, the, R, the record, RCA, <laughs> or whatever, mill, um, and this whole illusion was put out there to make them look and sound like they were really something special. Um, all of that goes, and it's replaced by a whole lot of people doing their own singing, doing their own dancing, doing their own acting, making their own movies, telling their own stories. And that just is very, very different from what we've had in the past, say, 100 years. I love so, that. It's already beginning. And some of the commerce yeah. that you're talking about before the World Wide Web or before anyone had heard that term or knew about it, they were showing you this incredible effect where individuals that have the ability to create something that they love and have the capacity to connect with someone somewhere else in the world and somehow right. 
exchange goods with each other. Of course, we didn't know what that was. And well, now we have Craigslist and <laughs> other ways of doing commerce. Yeah. With each other. It's, it's interesting because again, this, these concepts, well, these realities were not part of everyday understanding. Only a few in the country understood what that capability was going to be in the future. So, That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, and I think in that whole process of, uh, you know, there was a recycling aspect to that, which I didn't say anything in the book, but, you know, my junk was somebody else's treasure over, you know, halfway around the world, and, um, and there were people who did move from country to country or across country and they carried stuff for other people they were not big truckers <laughs> you know these were just people who said i'm going to be leaving this town and going to that town Does anybody need anything delivered and they get a little something for that you know maybe something maybe nothing but you know we were getting rid of junk that we weren't using because everything was needed there was a period where everything was needed um, because not much production was going on and so very little waste was happening um, you know I like that I came from the farm you know, we didn't waste anything and we didn't have a trash man and you know we burnt our own papers and we put our composted our garbage and we took our trash you know our tin cans we didn't have many tin cans because we hardly ever went to the store we grew our own food so you know there we're kind of moving ahead into a world where we have the best of the old and the best of the new and I kind of like that. So. It, was, it was very encouraging because it's a much more cooperative and collaborative way to live. And when we go into our next conversation, it brings about the word the family in a new way. Not the families you were talking about, but a completely different way of living as groups in extended families where this is occurring after much of the infrastructure has collapsed. The roadways don't work the same anymore. Communication is good communication is ubiquitous but the ability to transport things as you just mentioned has changed and we're going to another thing uh you talk about in the book i really love that we'll get into in our next conversation is the frequencies work with our brains and our memory and our ability to communicate with our higher self, which is really going to be the guiding system for our inner authority and sovereignty in the future. And that whole section of the book is beautiful. So we'll do yeah. that for our next conversation because it's a big conversation. Okay. All right. Yeah. That really, we are headed to such exciting times and such extraordinary abilities and amazing architecture and engineering, amazing computer stuff. It's, uh, oh my gosh. So. <laughs> oh, and even more, what I loved is the vision of our future housing because I had that same vision Oh God, when I was 20 years old, and that became my model for what I wanted for my home. It's the same thing that shows up in the oh. I'm excited about it. And what we all have to acknowledge, knowing about these things now is going to give us a bit of some segue time to begin reaching into recreating our futures and our relationships with one another. And that was really your job they charged you with is letting yeah. people well, we have major changes coming up, but we can yeah. fully move into them, right? That's true. Yeah, they um, they really wanted me to help teach, and I was not interested, and I was just not there at that time. Um, but you know, things change. They said, you know, you came here for a reason. Everybody's here for a reason, in fact. And um, they said, we just want you to renew your promise. <laughs> and I was like, what? Get out of here. <laughs> I did not want to be tied down. Um, and I was frightened by the, you know, by the job that I saw myself doing. And they said to me, never mind, don't worry. It'll just all unfold naturally. And it has. It has. And I have learned so much. Um, you know, I'm not even close to being the same person I was back then. 
Yeah. Not even close. So. Well, I really yeah. appreciate the fact you finally listened to them and you finally wrote it all down for everyone else's benefit. And I'm very excited about a lot of the potential of what our future holds for us. So on that note, we will stop this conversation also next time. I'm hoping that the buzz that's in the background that neither one of us can figure out, we can't hear it, but this sound I can hear, I don't know if the viewers can hear it or not, but I'm hearing it. Hopefully that'll be gone next time. So on that, thank you so much, Penny, and we'll get back together in a few weeks. How's that? Very good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and to everybody else, thank you so much for joining us here on ReginaMeredith.com.